Hello. This is an absolutely no notice reading of chapter four of The Shack by Eugene Peterson. So you can catch up later, I guess, if you've been listening along to the book. Uh, but I had half an hour free, so I thought, let's go for it. Chapter four, The Great Sadness. Max stood on the shore, doubled over and still trying to catch his breath. It took a few minutes before he even thought about Missy. Remembering that she had been colouring it in her book at the table, he walked up the bank to where he could see the campsite, but there was no sign of her. His pace quickened as he hurried to the tent trailer, calling her name as calmly as he could manage. No response. She was not there. Even though his heart skipped a beat, he rationalised that in the confusion, someone had seen to her, probably Sarah Madison or Vicky Doucette or one of the older kids. Not wanting to appear over-anxious or panicky, he found and soberly informed his two new friends that he couldn't find Missy and asked if they would each check with their families. Both quickly headed off to their respective campsites. Jesse returned first to announce that Sarah had not seen Missy at all that morning. He and Mac then headed for the Doucette site, but before they reached it, Emil came hurrying towards them, a look of apprehension written clearly on his face. No one has seen Missy today, and we don't know where Amber is either. Maybe they're together. There was a hint of dread in Emil's question. I'm sure that's it, said Mac, trying to reassure, reassure himself and Emil at the same time. Where do you think they might be? Why don't we check the bathrooms and showers, suggested Jesse. Good idea, said Mac. I'll check the one nearest our site, the one my kids use. Why don't you and Emil check the one between your sites? They nodded and Mac headed at a slow trot towards the closest showers, noticing for the first time that he was barefoot and shirtless. What a sight I must be, he thought, and probably would have chuckled if his mind wasn't so focused on Missy. Arriving at the restrooms, he asked a teenager emerging from the women's section if she had seen a little girl in a red dress inside, or maybe two girls. She told him that she hadn't noticed but would look again. In less than a minute, she was back shaking her head. Thank you anyway, said Mac, and headed around the back of the building where the showers were located. As he rounded the corner, he began calling loudly for Missy. Mac could hear water running, but no one res responded. Wondering if Missy might be in one of the showers, he began pounding on each until he got a response. He succeeded only in severely scaring a poor elderly lady when his door banging accidentally opened her shower stall. She shrieked and Mac, with profuse apologies, quickly shut the door and hurried on to the next one. Six shower stalls and no Missy. He checked the men's toilet stalls and showers, trying not to think about why he would even bother looking there. She was nowhere, and he jogged back towards Emile's, unable to pray anything except, Oh God, help me find her. Oh God, please help me find her. When she saw him, Vicky rushed out to meet him. She had been trying not to cry, but couldn't help it as they embraced. Suddenly, Mac desperately wanted Nan to be there. She would know what to do at least what the right thing was. He felt so lost. Sarah has Josh, Josh and Kate back at your campsite, so don't worry about them, Vicky told him between sobs. Oh God, Mac thought, having totally forgotten about his other two. What kind of a father am I? Although he was relieved that Sarah had them, he now wished even more that Nan were here. Just then, Emile and Jesse burst into camp, Emile appearing relieved and Jesse looking as tense as a wound up spring. We found her, exclaimed Emile, his face lighting up, then turning sombre as he realised what he had implied. I mean, we found Amber. She just came back from taking a shower at this other place that still had hot water. She said she told her mum, but Vicky probably didn't hear her. His voice trailed off. But we didn't find Missy, Jessie added quickly, answering the most important question. Amber hasn't seen her today either. Emile, all business now, took charge. Mac, we need to contact the campground authorities immediately and get the word out to find Missy. Maybe in the ruckus and excitement she got scared and confused and just wandered away and got lost, or maybe she was trying to find us and took a wrong turn. Do you have a picture of her? Maybe there's a copy machine at the office and we could make a few copies and save some time. Yeah, I have a snapshot of her in my wallet. He reached for his back pocket and for a second panicked as he found nothing there. The thought flashed through his mind of his wallet sitting at the bottom of Wallowa Lake, and then he remembered that it was still in his van after yesterday's trip up the tram. The three headed back to Mac's site. 
Jessie ran ahead to let Sarah know that Amber was safe, but that Missy's whereabouts was still unknown. Arriving at camp, Mac hugged and encouraged Josh and Kate as best he could, trying to appear calm for their sakes. Changing out of his wet clothes, he threw on a t-shirt and jeans, some clean dry socks and a pair of running shoes. Sarah promised that she and Vicky would keep his older two with them and whispered that she was praying for him and Missy. Mac gave her a quick hug and thanked her and after kissing his children joined the other two men as together they jogged towards the campground office. Word of the water rescue had reached the little two-room camp headquarters ahead of them and everyone there was in high spirits. This changed quickly as the three took turns explaining Missy's disappearance. Fortunately, the office had a photocopier and Mac enlarged half a dozen pictures of Missy, handing them round. The Wallowa Lake campground has 215 sites divided into five loops and three group areas. The young assistant manager, Jeremy Bellamy, volunteered to help canvas, so they divided the camp into four areas and each headed out armed with a map, Missy's picture and an office walkie-talkie. One assistant with a walkie-talkie also went back to Mac's site to report in if Missy turned up there. It was slow, methodical work, much too slow for Mac, but he knew that this was the most logical way to find her if, if she was still on the campground. As he walked between tents and trailers, he was praying and promising. He knew in his heart that promising things to God was rather dumb and irrational, but he couldn't help it. He was desperate to get Missy back and surely God knew where she was. Many campers were either not at their sites or in the final stages of packing up to head home. No one, he asked, had seen Missy or anyone looking like her. Periodically, the search parties checked in with the office to get an update on the progress, if any, that each was making. Nothing at all, until almost two in the afternoon. Mac was finishing his section when the call came in on the walkie-talkies. Jeremy, who had taken the area nearest the entrance, thought he had something. Emile instructed them to put a mark on their mat showing where each had left off, and then he gave them the site number where Jeremy had called from. Mac was the last to arrive, and he walked in on an intense conversation involving Emile, Jeremy, and a third young man that Mac did not recognise. Emile quickly brought Mac up to speed, introducing him to Virgil Thomas, a city boy from California, who had been camping all summer in the area with some buddies. Virgil and his friends had crashed after partying late into the night, and he had been the only one who saw an old military green truck heading out of the entrance and down the road towards Joseph. About what time was that? Mac asked. Like I told him, Virgil said, pointing his thumb at Jeremy. It was before noon. I'm not sure how much before noon, though. I was kind of hung over, and, and we haven't really been paying much attention to clocks since we got here. Pushing the picture of Missy in front of the young man, Mac asked sharply, Do you think you saw her? When the other fellow first showed me that picture, she didn't look too familiar. Virgil answered, looking again at the photo. But then when he said she was wearing a bright red dress, I remembered that the little girl in the green truck was wearing red, and she was either laughing or bellowing, I couldn't really tell. And then it looked like the guy slapped her or pushed her down, but I suppose he could have just been playing too. Mac felt paralysed. The information was overwhelming to him. But unfortunately, it was the only thing they had heard that made any sense. It explained why they found no trace of Missy. But everything in him didn't want it to be true. He turned and started to run towards the office, but he was halted by Emile's voice. Mac, stop. We've already radioed the office and contacted the sheriff in Joseph. They're sending someone here right away and are putting out an APB on the truck. As he finished speaking, as if on cue, two patrol cars pulled into the campgrounds. The first headed directly for the office, while the other turned into the section where they all stood waiting. Mac waved the officer down and hurried to meet him as he emerged from his vehicle. A young man who looked to be in his late twenties introduced himself as Officer Dalton and began taking their statements. The next hours saw a massive escalation in response to Missy's disappearance. An all-points bulletin was sent out as far west as Portland, east to Boyce, Idaho, and north, north to Spokane, Washington. Police officers in Joseph set up a roadblock on the Imaha Highway, which led out of Joseph and deeper into the Hell's Canyon National Recreation Area. 
If the child stealer had taken Missy up the Imnaha, only one of many directions he could have gone. The police figured they could get pertinent information by questioning those coming out. Their resources were limited and rangers in the area were also contacted to be on the lookout. The Phillips's campsite was cordoned off as a crime scene and everyone in the vicinity was questioned. Virgil offered as much detail as he could about the truck and its occupants and the resulting description was flashed out to all relevant agencies. The FBI field offices in Portland, Seattle and Denver were put on notice. Nan had been called and was on her way, being driven by her best friend, Mary Ann. Even tracking dogs were brought in, but Missy's trail ended in the nearby parking lot, increasing the likelihood that Virgil's story was accurate. After forensic specialists had combed through his campsite, Officer Dalton asked Mac to re-enter the area and carefully look to see if anything was out of place or different than he remembered. Although already exhausted by the emotions of the day, Mac was desperate to do anything to help and deliberately focused his mind to try and remember whatever he could about the morning. Cautiously, so as not to disturb anything, he retraced his steps. What he would give for a do-over, a chance to have this day start again from the beginning. Even if he burned his fingers and dropped the pancake batter all over again, if only he could take it back. Again he turned back to his assigned task, but nothing seemed to be different from how he remembered. Nothing had changed. He came to the table where P Missy had been busy. The book was open to the page she had been colouring, a half-finished picture of the Multnomah Indian princess. The crayons were also there, although Missy's favourite colour, red, was missing. He began to look around on the ground to see where it might have fallen. If you're looking for the red crayon, we found it over there by the tree, said Dalton, pointing, to pointing towards the parking lot. She probably dropped it when she was struggling with... His voice trailed off. How can you tell she was struggling? Mac demanded. The officer hesitated but then spoke almost reluctantly. We found one of her shoes near there in the bushes where it was probably kicked off. You weren't here at the time so we asked your son to identify it. The image of his daughter fighting off some perverted monster was like a fist to the stomach. Almost succumbing to the sudden blackness that threatened to smother him, Mac leaned on the table to keep from passing out or throwing up. It was then that he noticed a ladybug pin sticking in the colouring book. He snapped to awareness as if someone had opened smelling salts under his nose. Whose is that? He asked Dalton, pointing to the pin. Whose is what? This ladybug pin. That's a ladybird to British people. Who put that there? We just assumed it was Missy's. Are you telling me that pin was not there this morning? I'm positive, asserted Mac adamantly. She doesn't own anything like that. I am absolutely positive that it was not here this morning. Officer Dalton was already on his radio and within minutes forensics were back and had taken the pin into custody. Dalton took Mac aside and explained, if what you say is correct, then we have to assume that Missy's assailant left it here on purpose. He paused before adding, Mr. Phillips, this could be good news or bad. I don't understand, responded Mac. The officer again hesitated, trying to decide whether he should tell Mac what he was thinking. He searched for the right words. Well, the good news is that we might get some evidence off of it. It's the only thing we have so far linking him to the scene. And the bad news? Mac held his breath. Well, the bad news, and I'm not saying that this is the case here, but guys who leave something like this usually have a purpose in leaving it, and it usually means that they have done this before. What are you saying? Max snapped. That this guy is some kind of serial killer? Is this some sort of mark that he leaves behind to identify himself, like he's marking his territory or something? Mac was getting angry, and it was evident by the look on Dalton's face that he was sorry for even mentioning it. But before Mac could blow, Dalton received an incoming call on his belt radio, radio, patching him through to the FBI field office in Portland, Oregon. Mac refused to leave and listened as a woman identified herself as a special agent. She asked Dalton to describe the pin in detail. Mac followed the officer to where the forensic team had set up a work area. The pin was securely inside a Ziploc bag and standing just behind the group, he eavesdropped as Dalton described it as best he could. 
It, it's a ladybug stick pin that was stuck through some pages of a colouring book. Like one of those pins a woman would wear on her lapel, I think. Please describe the colours and the number of darts on the ladybug, directed the voice over the radio. Let's see, said Dalton, with his eyes almost up to the pouch. The head is black with a, um, a ladybug head. And the body is red with black edges and divisions. There are two black dots on the left hand side of the body as you look down from above with the head at the top. Does that make sense? Perfectly. Please go on, the voice said patiently. And on the right side of the ladybug there are three dots, so five in all. There was a pause. Are you sure there are five dots? Yes ma'am, there are five dots. He looked up and saw Mac, who had moved to the other side to see better, make eye contact, and shrugged his shoulders as if to indicate, who cares how many darts? Okay now, Officer Dabney, Dalton ma'am, Tommy, Dal Tommy Dalton. He looked up at Mac again and rolled his eyes. Sorry, Officer Dalton, would you please turn over the pin and tell me what is on the bottom or underside of the ladybug? Dalton turned the pouch over and looked carefully. There is something here engraved on the bottom, Special Agent. Uh, I didn't get your name exactly. Wikowski, spelled just like it sounds. Is it some letters or numbers? Well, let me see. Yeah, I think you're right. It looks like some kind of model number. Um, CK146, I believe. Yeah, Charlie Kilo 146. It's tough to make it out through the baggie. There was silence on the other end. Mac whispered to Dalton, Ask her why or what that means. Dalton hesitated and then complied. Again, there was an extended silence on the other end. Wikowski, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Suddenly the voice sounded tired and hollow. Hey, Dalton, are you someplace private where you can talk? Mac nodded with exaggeration and Dalton got the message. Hold on a sec. He put down the pouch with the pin and moved outside the area, allowing Mac to follow. Dalton was already way beyond protocol with him anyway. Yep, I am now. So tell me, what's the scoop on this ladybug? He inquired. We've been trying to catch this guy for almost four years, tracking him across more than nine states now. He's been continually moving west. He's been nicknamed the little lady killer, but we have never released the ladybug detail to the press or anyone else. So please keep that on the down low. We believe he's responsible for abducting and killing at least four children so far. All girls, all under the age of ten. Each time he adds a dart to the ladybugs, so this would be number five. He always leaves the same pin somewhere at the kidnap scene, all with the same model number. Like he bought a box of them, but we've had no luck tracking down where they originally came from. We haven't found one of the bodies of any of those four little girls, and although forensics has come up with nothing, we have good reason to believe that none of the girls have survived. Every crime has taken place at or near a campsite area, with a state park or a reserve close by. The perpetrator seems to be an expert woodsman and mountaineer. In every case he has left us absolutely nothing, except the pin. What about the car? We have a pretty good description of the green truck he left in. Oh, you'll probably find it all right. If this is our guy, it will have been stolen a day or two ago, repainted, full of outdoor gear, and it will be wiped clean. As he listened to Dalton's conversation with Special Agent Wikowski, Mac felt the last of his hope draining away. He slumped to the ground and buried his face in his hands. Was there ever a man as tired as he was at this moment? For the first time since Missy's disappearance, he allowed himself to consider the range of horrendous possibilities, and once it started, he couldn't stop. The imaginations of good and evil all mixed up together in a soundless but terrifying parade. Even when he tried to shake free of the images, he couldn't. Some were horrible, ghastly snapshots of torture and pain, of monsters and demons of the deepest dark with barbed wire fingers and razor touches, of Missy screaming for her daddy and no one answering. And mixed throughout these horrors were flashes of other memories. The toddler with her Missy sippy cup as they had called it, the two-year-old drunk from eating too much chocolate cake and the one image so recently made as she fell asleep safely in her daddy's arms. Unyielding images, 
What would he say at her funeral? What could he possibly say to Nan? How could this have happened? God, how could this happen? A few hours later, Mac and his two children drove to the hotel in Joseph that had become the staging grounds for the growing search. The proprietors had kindly offered them a complimentary room and as he moved a few of his things into it, his exhaustion began to get the better of him. He had gratefully accepted Officer Dalton's offer to take his children down to a local diner for some food and now, sitting down on the edge of the bed, he was swept helplessly away in the unrelenting and merciless grip of growing despair, slowly rocking back and forth. Soul-shredding sobs and groans clawed to the surface from the core of his being, and that is how Nan found him. Two broken lovers, they held each other and wept as Mac poured out his sorrow and Nan tried to hold him in one piece. That night, Mac slept in fits and starts as the images continued to pound him, like relentless waves on a rocky shore. Finally, he gave up, just before the sun began to issue hints of its arrival. He hardly noticed. In one day, he had spent a year's worth of emotions, and now he felt numb, adrift in a suddenly meaningless world that felt like it would be forever grey. After considerable protest from Nan, they agreed it would be best for her to head home with Josh and Kate. Mac would remain to help in any way he could, and to be close, just in case. He simply couldn't leave, not when she might still be out there needing him. Word had quickly spread, and friends arrived to help him pack up the site and cart everything back to Portland. His boss called, offering any support he could and encouraging Mac to stay as long as he needed. Everyone they knew was praying. Reporters, with their photographers in tow, began showing up during the morning. Mac didn't want to face them or their cameras, but after some coaching he spent time answering their questions in the parking lot, knowing the exposure could go a long way to help in the search for Missy. He had kept quiet about Officer Dalton overstepping his protocol, and Dalton returned the favour by keeping him inside the information loop. Jesse and Sarah, willing to do anything, made themselves constantly available to the family and friends who came to help. They lifted the huge burden of communication with the public from both Nan and Mac, and seemed to be everywhere as they skillfully wove some threads of peace into the turbulent emotions. Emile Doucette's parents arrived after driving all the way from Denver to help Vicky and the kids get home safely. Emile, with the blessing of his superiors, had decided to stay behind to do what he could with the park service to help Mac stay informed on that side of things. Nan, who had bonded quickly with both Sarah and Vicky, had distracted herself by helping with little JJ and then getting her own children ready for their trip back to Portland. And when she broke down, as she frequently did, Vicky or Sarah were there to weep and pray with her. When it became clear that the need for their assistance was winding down, the Madisons packed up their own site and then came by for a teary farewell before heading north. As Jesse gave Mac a long hug, he whispered that they would see each other again and that he would be in prayer for all of them. Sarah, tears rolling down her cheeks, simply kissed Mac on the forehead and then held on to Nan, who again broke into sobs and moans. Sarah sang something, words Mac couldn't quite hear, but it calmed his wife until she was steady enough to let Sarah go. Mac couldn't even bear to watch as the couple finally walked away. As the Doucettes ready to go, readied to go, Mac took a minute to thank Amber and Emmy for comforting and reaching out to his own, especially when he couldn't. Josh cried his goodbyes. He wasn't brave anymore, at least not today. Kate, on the other hand, had become a rock, busying herself making sure that everyone had everyone else's addresses and emails. Vicky's world had been shaken by the events, and now she had to be almost pried from Nan as her own grief threatened to sweep her away. Nan held her, stroking her hair and whispering prayers into her ear until she was settled enough to walk to the waiting car. By noon, all of the families were on the road. Mary Ann drove Nan and the kids home where family would be waiting to care for and comfort them. Mac and Emile joined Officer Dalton, who was now just Tommy, and headed into Joseph in Tommy's patrol car. There they grabbed sandwiches, which were barely touched, and then drove to the police station. Tommy Dalton was the father of two daughters himself, his oldest being only five, so it was easy to see that this case struck a particular nerve with him. He extended every kindness and courtesy he could to his new friends, especially Mac. 
Now came the hardest part, waiting. Mac felt like he was moving in slow motion inside the eye of a hurricane of activity happening all around him. Reports filtered in from everywhere. Even Emil was busy networking with the people and professionals he knew. The FBI entourage arrived mid-afternoon from field offices in three cities. It was clear from the start that the person in charge was Special Agent Wachowski, a small slim woman who was all fire in motion and to whom Mac took an instant liking. She publicly returned the favour and from that moment on no one questioned his presence at even the most intimate of conversations or debriefings. After setting up their command centre at the hotel, the FBI asked Mac to come in for a formal interview, something they insisted was routine in these kind of circumstances. Agent Wachowski rose from behind the desk she was working at and held out her hand. As he reached for the handshake, she clasped both her hands around his and smiled grimly. Mr Phillips, I apologise that we haven't been able to spend much time with you so far. We've been frantically busy setting up communications with all the law enforcement and other agencies involved in trying to get Missy back safely. I'm so sorry that we have to meet under such conditions. Mac believed her. Mac, he said. I beg your pardon? Mac, please call me Mac. Well, Mac, then please call me Sam. Short for Samantha, but I grew up kind of a tomboy and beat up the kids who would dare call me Samantha to my face. Mac couldn't help but smile, relaxing a little into the chair as he watched her quickly sort through a couple of folders full of papers. Mac, are you up for a few questions? She asked without even looking up. I'll do my best, he answered, grateful for the opportunity to do, ever, to do anything. Good. I won't make you walk through all the details again. I have the reports on everything you told the others, but I have a couple of uh, important things to go over with you. She looked up, making eye contact. Anything I can do to help, confessed Mac. I'm feeling very useless at the moment. Mac, I understand how you feel, but your presence here is important. And believe me, there is not a person here who doesn't care about your missy. We will do everything in our power to get her back safely. Thank you, was all Mac could say, and he looked down at the floor. Emotion seemed so near the surface, and even the least bit of kindness seemed to poke holes in his reserve. OK, now, I've had a good off-the-record talk with your friend Officer Tommy, and he filled me in on everything that you and he have talked about, so don't feel like you have to protect his butt. He's all right in my book. Mac looked up and nodded and smiled again at her. So... Have you noticed anyone strange around your family these past few days? Mac was surprised and sat back in his chair. You mean he's been stalking us? No, he seems to choose his victims at random, though they were all about the age of your daughter with similar hair colour. We think he spots them for a day or two before and waits and watches from nearby for an opportune moment. Have you seen anyone unusual or out of place near the lake, perhaps near the bathrooms? Mac recoiled at the thought of his children being watched, being targets. He tried to think past his own imagination but came up blank. I'm sorry, not that I can remember. Did you stop anywhere on your way to the campgrounds or notice anyone strange when you were hiking or sightseeing in the area? We stopped at Multnomah Falls on the way here and we've been all over the area the past few days but I, I don't recall seeing anyone who looked out of the ordinary. Who would have thought that? Exactly, Mac, so don't beat yourself up. Something may come to mind later. No matter how small or irrelevant it might seem, please let us know. She paused to look at another paper on her desk. What about a green military truck? Have you noticed anything like that around while you were here? Mac raked his memory. I can't really remember seeing anything like it. Special Agent Wachowski continued to question Mac for the next 15 minutes but could not jar his memory enough to provide anything helpful. She finally closed her notebook and stood, extending her hand. Mac, again, I'm so sorry about Missy. If anything breaks, I will personally let you know the minute it happens. That's all for today, folks. See you again.